Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. We gather today to celebrate our Lord who bore our sins to the cross and the grave, acknowledging that he is bodily risen from the dead, proclaiming forgiveness of our sins, the defeat of death, the last enemy, and even a trampling of Satan under his feet who can now no longer determine our course of life or our future. We gather today to sing our alleluias once again, praising the Lord for the great things he has done for us in Jesus Christ and saying thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The message of Easter encapsulated in one sentence is we win with Jesus who has won the victory for us. Welcome all of you to this celebration of our Lord's resurrection this Easter day, March 31st, 2024. Today we gather not only to thank God for that blessing of faith and resurrection, but also to receive the benefits of that resurrection. So today as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, um, we acknowledge that many of you may be visiting our congregation, for which we're very thankful. Um, in order to respect the responsibility Christ gives us in administering this precious gift, uh, we ask that only those who are members of ELS or Wells congregations would commune with us this morning. If you'd like to speak with me, though, about communing in the future, I would be more than glad to talk to you about that after the service. In order to celebrate our Lord's resurrection, we're using the ancient liturgy of the Western Christian Church. That's recorded for us in Rite 2 with Communion. For those of you with a bulletin, that service is printed there for you, the liturgy with the hymns. Um, but if you'd like to follow along in the hymnal for additional musical notation, that service is found on page 60 in the front part of the hymnal. We join together now in singing our opening hymn, hymn 352, Jesus Christ is Risen Today. <laughs>
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Let us bow before the Lord and confess our sins. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess to you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God to all of you. And in the stead and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May he comfort your heart by his holy absolution and strengthen you by his sacraments, that your joy may be full. Peace be with you. Amen. Oh, 
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, you have overcome death and opened unto us the gate of everlasting life. We humbly beseech you that, as you put in our minds good desires, so by your continual help we may bring them to good effect. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one true God, now and forever. You may be seated. Our Old Testament lesson is taken from the book of Job, chapter 19. Oh, that my words were written, oh, that they were inscribed in a book, oh, that with an iron pen and lead they were engraved in the rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth, and after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. The word of the Lord. The epistle lesson is recorded for us in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 5. St. Paul wrote, Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are, unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival not with the old leaven, 
the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. The Holy Gospel for this Easter day is taken from the Gospel according to St. Mark, the 16th chapter. Glory be to you. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him, that is Jesus. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Let us confess our holy faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things, visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. We sing hymn 343, stanzas 1, 4, 6, and 7. Christ Jesus lay in death strong bands. Hymn 343, stanzas 1, four, six, and seven.
Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Dear fellow redeemed, you who have been bought back to God by the precious blood of Christ and now raised with him in his resurrection to live a new life, experiencing this great springtime of the soul. Holiday we celebrate today, we call Easter. But in most languages of the world, people call it by some form of the name Pascha, which comes from the Hebrew word that means Passover. So there's an intimate connection between this Old Testament festival of the Passover and what we're celebrating today, Easter. Jesus' death and resurrection, if you recall, took place while the Passover was being celebrated in Jerusalem. Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper out of a Passover meal, saying that that Passover meal was always about him. It's sometimes harder for us to imagine that God delivered his grace back in time, but it's the same as him delivering his grace forward in time through his word and sacraments now. So he instituted this festival to teach his Old Testament people about Christ. The original Passover took place 1,500 years before the first Easter, yet it was but an expression of what God did fully and to the utmost in Christ. Make sinners into his people, overcome death, forgive, and transform hearts and minds. The Passover came about because of God. Now I want you to think about something in life. Do you ever look at someone and you say to yourself, that person is going places. That person is going places. They're put together, they're energized, they're making connections, they're motivated, and there's just a sense about them. You say, that person is going places. The Passover, in large part, was about people going places, but not because of their initiative, as I said, because of God's. The Passover came about because God took the initiative to free his people from slavery in Egypt. 400 years those people had served the Egyptians, and now he took action to free them to go somewhere, to the land that he had promised them and their ancestors. And here's how it all happened. God sent plague after plague, affliction after affliction, to bend the stubborn will of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, to let God's people go, to no avail. So finally, God came to that tenth plague, which was the death of the firstborn. God said, on an appointed night, I'm going to pass through the land of Egypt, and the firstborn son of every family, both animal and human, will die. Unless there's blood. To the Israelites, God gave this promise. He said, you take a lamb, perfect, a year old, and on the appointed night, you kill that lamb. You paint its blood on your, on your doorposts and you eat its roasted flesh. And God said, when I pass through the land of Egypt, I will see the blood on your doors. A death has already been rendered for this house and I will pass over. You and your sons will live. Now the Passover is Christ. Christ is the Passover. God sent Jesus not as a lamb who would free us from some earthly affliction or slavery, but Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, whose blood on us makes death and condemnation pass over so we can be free to go to that place Christ has prepared for us, eternal life in heaven, our promised land forever. But I know I'm getting ahead of myself. Back to the Israelites. God also said, oh, and by the way, when you eat the roasted meat of that lamb, eat it with bread, unleavened bread. And the point God made was this. When I act, things are going to happen so quickly, you won't have time to wait for your bread to rise. So get rid of the yeast because you are going places. Lo and behold, it happened just as God said. The Israelites killed their lambs, painted the blood, ate the meat with unleavened bread. And when Pharaoh and all of Egypt woke up to find their firstborn sons dead, they couldn't get rid of the Israelites fast enough. Now, Pharaoh even changed his mind after that, and he came out with his army to bring them back into bondage. To finish the Bible history lesson here, he met the Israelites at the Red Sea. You remember what happened there? God parted those waters, and the Israelites walked through on dry ground. Pharaoh and his army followed them onto the seabed, but when they entered the sea, the water came back and drowned them all. Oh, the Israelites were going places, but not because of themselves, because they had a God who was a saving God, a God who promised to do everything to bring them to the place he promised they would go. 
If the Christian life is one of movement toward heaven, propelled by God's word, we're going to focus on the words of our epistle lesson today, where Paul writes to Christians who we could say were, were stuck. Let me read the words of our epistle lesson again. Paul wrote to those Christians in Corinth, Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And you catch all that background. He's saying the Passover, which is really fulfilled in Christ, is the only way to move forward in your walk of faith. These people were mired in sin, and frankly, it wasn't the sin that was the problem. Um, St. John Chrysostom, he was an ancient Christian pastor. He has this wonderful line about Easter. He said, let no one mourn that he falls again and again in the sins he struggles with. For forgiveness this day is risen from the grave. This is Easter. We who sin and should be punished and die because of those sins, we have had those sins punished and killed in Christ. And because he rises from the grave, it means that forgiveness itself is risen from the grave with our sins and hell left there in the tomb. It wasn't forgiveness that was the problem. Your sins today, likewise, big sins, small sins, sins you know you committed, sins you didn't realize you were committing, things you did and things you have failed to do, all forgiven through Christ. And Paul tells them this using the imagery of the Passover. He compares us to bread and sin to yeast. He said, you really are unleavened. That's who you are in Christ. Your sin is gone. And even beyond sin, all the other things we think might hamper our faith lives, our disappointments, our failures, our pain, our grief, our insecurities. He says, none of this has to be resolved in order for you to get where you're going. Because your final destination as a Christian is heaven, and that journey is guaranteed to you in the resurrection of Christ, just as it is guaranteed for you who grieve over those who have died in Christ, for those loved ones of yours as well. Paul's saying, you are going places. Nothing can stop that. But the exhortation today is, even though no one can take you off of that path, don't stop yourself. There's an interesting episode of the Passover and the Exodus, people leaving Egypt, and that it wasn't just Pharaoh who came out to bring the Israelites back into bondage. Short period of time passed, and there were certain Israelites who said, we want to go back to Egypt. It was all they'd ever known, but it was back to slavery. How foolish. And yet these Corinthian Christians were doing the same thing spiritually. Many of them had come out of this pagan, unbelieving lifestyle and world. That's all they'd known. And there was this pull for them back into that world and back into that life. So Paul describes in this letter how there was adultery tolerated in the congregation. A man was sleeping with his stepmother. There were class divisions getting played out in their congregational life. Sometimes their, their service gatherings turned into rowdy parties instead of reverent worship of Jesus. They were gathering in factions around different pastors and forming rivalries with one another. And of course, all these sins could have been forgiven. The main problem was they were okay with it. In fact, they were boasting, Paul says, because they were able to be tolerant of all these stylish sins among them. They could live so harmoniously with the pagan world that they were surrounded by. But they weren't making any movement as God's people because they wanted to go back to slavery. So Paul, in a very understated way, says, your boasting is not good. Now let's bring it home. You who maybe think that you are great, celebrated people in the world, maybe even better Christians, because you're open and tolerant about whatever form of sexual deviancy is proclaimed and lauded today in our society, your boasting is not good. We should have a heart for people struggling with sin. But we should not accept it as a beautiful part of the freedom of Christ because it's not. Or you who think that you're better than other people because of racist ideas, because of class divisions or other prejudices, your boasting is not good. You who find your glory not so much in Christ but in the markers of your 
your wealth and affluence or your influence and power. And you who do everything to keep those markers, even if it means living beyond your means or neglecting other good parts of life, your boasting is not good. You who think that one or the other of our 21st century American political parties does not just provide a way forward in life that's politically wise, but that must be God's way, your boasting is not good. Paul wrote in Galatians 6, Far be it from me to boast in anything except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. This doesn't mean that we live completely separate from the world, but we do consider ourselves a different element within it, and we practice discernment in everything. And we could talk about all those issues individually that I mentioned, but the common denominator among them is, you're not going anywhere, people of God, if you're content to sit in the mainstream of the world and let it choose your direction in life. So what gets us moving in the right direction again, toward the place God wants us to go? It's Jesus, crucified and risen from the dead. It's not well, perfectly crafted arguments about why Christianity is correct or why our social thoughts are the, are the right ones. As much as those can serve a function, this is a matter of faith. It's not a matter of being convinced. It's a matter of servile submission to Christ, who is your only hope, your only way out of this life alive. What he says goes. To the Israelites, it wasn't their discipline or wisdom or, or nice persuasive arguments from God about why they should kill that lamb. It was simply the death of the lamb and God's promise connected to it that got him out of slavery and got him a new life. And so it is with us. You are going places, Christians, good places. Don't let anything bog you down in the process. And Paul actually gives us some very good direction in doing that. He uses this whole theme again of bread and yeast. He says, do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? A few years ago, when we were all experiencing the, the COVID-19 lockdowns, it's almost a cliche that everyone got into sourdough baking. Remember that? Maybe some of you are still baking sourdough bread because of that. And what we learned from sourdough starters is that yeast is everywhere. It floats around in the air. You can put out a wet dough of flour and water and the yeast will find it. It will grow in there and give it enough time. It'll be as leavened as if you had put yeast in it from the beginning. Paul uses this apt picture to say, so it is with sin. So it is with things that will hinder your walk of faith with Christ. So it is with things that are bad for you and bad for the people around you, bad for Christian congregations. We see that there is bad advice, there are false ideas, there are appeals to your base instincts and your worst desires floating out there in the world. And so slight can be the first interaction, um, the first initiation but if that sin is able to gain a foothold in you, it will grow. And Paul's claim is, if left unchecked, it will change who you are. So cleanse out the old leaven with sincerity and truth, because Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. That means the Christian life is one of continual self-examination, openness, transparency, truth about yourself, about what sins have gained a foothold in your life. That's contrasted with malice and evil. If you think about those things, that's a defensive posture. I'm trying to protect and justify everything I do, even things that might keep me separated from Christ, while lashing out at anyone who might want to help me get close to him by calling out those sins in my life. Sincerity and truth means being sincere about yourself. So let's be sincere and truthful for a couple minutes. What small influences have gotten into you and grown and are keeping you separate from Christ? For some of you, is this the first time you've been in church all year? I'm not using that as a guilt trip. The message of Easter is God's power in our lives is real. And that power and how it impacts us and how it comforts and assures us is often in direct relation to how much time we spend with Christ and God in his word and sacrament. If you want that power, here it is. Or, how about other areas of life? Have you been sleeping with someone who's not your spouse? 
or letting your fantasies run wild in that direction because sexual permissiveness floats in the air around us in our culture. Have you been drinking too much, using substances to dull the pain and avoid problems? Have you been lazy, not maybe to the point of neglecting your family and, and cheating your boss or company out of anything, but you're not being faithful either? Have you been using video games or entertainment as a replacement for living the life that those things portray? Is it gossip and criticism that first comes to your mouth before anything else? In other words, are you stuck, like those Corinthians, falling in the ditch and frankly fine staying there? Well, if so, if you were able to pull out in that last minute some leaven from your life, I have good news for you. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. That leaven, that slavery is part of your past now. Get rid of it. Plan to move forward without it. Now, is it daunting to believe God's labels of us more than the labels we or the world put on ourselves? It can be. It's jarring to us. Is it terrifying to purge out parts of your lives that are so comfortable but so full of leaven? Yes, it is. Friends, the risen Christ is a terrifying prospect to us just as it was to the women who first went to the tomb. He disorients our lives, but it's the disorientation of slaves being set free and grappling with what this freedom means. Whatever you do, just don't prepare to stay where you are in your sin because Jesus didn't. He who took your sin to the grave is risen. And you, friends, united to him by faith, you are going places too. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Please stand for prayer. O oh Lord Christ, as we enjoy our freedom this day from the grave of sin and death, anticipating our resurrection to eternal life in the end. May we walk as living alleluias, living reasons why the world would turn to you, trust in faith, and praise the Lord. In our grief, make us living bearers of hope in your empty tomb. In our troubles, make us living examples of the angel's words, do not be alarmed. In confusion and doubt, Make us people who come to your word and sacraments, following our faith in the words. There you will see him, just as he told you. In life's everyday moments, which can seem so far from the overflowing joy of this day, make us living instruments of praise that we would recognize in every small blessing and pleasure a small ripple of the resurrection. For in your rising, life itself has been given back to us, not as a march to death and hell, but a parade of freedom to heaven, when by your power all things will be made new. We pray for Jeremiah Reif especially, who is suffering from a sickness today, and also for all who struggle, that they would hear the words in your resurrection that by your rising, God is now for us, with us always, and working out all things for our good. And we commend ourselves into your hands. In the joy of life, we today thank you especially also for the 80 years of life granted to Keith and Ken Yammer, twin brothers who celebrated their 80th birthday this past Friday. When we remember how frail our earthly lives are, it makes us all the more grateful for the years we are given. Continue to make Keith and Ken blessings to the people in their lives and to our congregation and bless them richly in the years ahead. Now bring our joy to the full as we come boldly to your table, eating the feast of assurance that our lives arc toward victory, your victory. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Lord. 
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good and right so to do. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. But chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. For he is the very Paschal Lamb which was offered for us and has taken away the sins of the world. By his death he has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again he has restored to us everlasting life. Therefore with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name evermore, praising you and saying, Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you and for many, for the remission of sins. This do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
Please stand for the Nunc Dimittis. Lord, now you let your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared. unto the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through these salutary gifts, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through them in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one true God, now and forever. The Lord be with you. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. 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 Please remain standing for our closing hymn. We sing hymn 351. Stanzas one, two, five, seven, and eight. I know that my Redeemer lives.
You may be seated. Again, a good morning, a welcome to all of you, a blessed Resurrection Sunday. Um, as you go about your day visiting family and friends, no doubt, and sharing the joy of the resurrection. Thank you to everyone who served this morning. Thank you to our elders, ushers, greeters, those who made the audio and video recordings of the service, to our organist today, Kate, to the choir and our choir accompanist, Sue, for um, delivering God's word more deeply into our hearts. A special welcome to guested visitors we have among us today, um, as well as maybe members of our congregation who haven't been here for a while. I know I made mention of that in the sermon, but I am so thrilled to have you here. Truly it is that if Easter is not a Sunday we celebrate, none of the rest of them matter when we gather. And yet I would encourage you, um, the power that we felt today, um, like yeast but in a positive way, ripples through our lives, grows and matures and expands itself as we gather week after week. So you're more than welcome to join us in the future. Guests and visit visitors, please do sign our, our guest register on the kiosk in the gathering space um, so we can be of service to you in the future. A couple announcements and future more thanks are in order. Thank you to everyone who... Um, Help to decorate our worship space for this Easter Sunday as an expression of our joy. Thank you also to all who gave um, Easter plants in memory of various uh, loved ones. Truly the resurrection gives us the hope of seeing them again in joy and glory, the promise of our resurrection. And we thank you for that reminder. You'll find various announcements about the life of our congregation, what goes on here, and you're welcome to take that in. The one special announcement I wanted to make was especially for families or the young families of our congregation. We're starting a new format of our Sunday school, our Sunday morning youth education, starting in a couple weeks on April 14th. Traditionally, we've held our, our Sunday school before the service um, at 9 a.m., but we're transferring it to after the service. So it'll be a shortened 20, 25 minute Sunday school class right after the service, our Sunday service at 10, so about 11 to 11, 20 or 25. During that time, you who bring kids can enjoy refreshments. There'll be coffee and some small treats. Um, and everyone will be able to still leave church by 1130. So we wanna make it as easy as possible for you families to uh, make it to church, um, have your children exposed to God's word, but also, of course, go about the rest of your, your weekend business. So please uh, bear that in mind. If you'd like to serve as a teacher or to help provide the refreshments, please speak to me or someone else um, in the church office. Um, and definitely fa families consider bringing your children to that educational opportunity coming up, again, starting on April 14th after the service. Those are all my announcements. It's been a privilege serving you with the Resurrection Gospel this morning. Safe travels to any who are going to um, see family and friends near or far. And until we meet again, God's peace. <laughs>